Well, very happy uh, Wednesday evening. This is a ham radio class, a technician ham radio class. Technician is the beginning amateur radio uh, license uh, in the United States. And I'm your instructor, Gary, ham radio call sign, Whiskey 4, Echo, Echo, Yankee. Well, Gary, ham radio, isn't that over and done with? Isn't that a hobby that's long gone the way of the dinosaurs? Ah, not so. It's still a lot of fun. Uh, and you can get your own amateur radio license and, and begin uh, transmitting on VHF and UHF and high frequencies uh, and have a lot of fun. So what we do, um, and we're about midway through the class, uh, we're going to be covering chapter four tonight, chapter four in this book. It's the American Radio Relay League License Manual, fifth edition. Uh, available uh, at bookstores or Amazon or ARRL.org, their own store. Uh, American Radio Relay League, it's the national organization of ham radio operators. And so if you'd like to get your ham radio license or learn more, uh, go back in the playlist uh, that this uh, video is in or search my uh, YouTube channel and uh, look for the introduction, give you some background information. Uh, we'd love to have you catch up with us and uh, get your amateur radio license by passing a 35 question multiple choice test. No Morse code required anymore. So um, that's uh, for many people a very good thing. So uh, because some people had a hard time with that. I know I did even. So anyway. So uh, we're going to get started here with the chapter four antennas. Well, propagation antennas and feed lines. They all kind of fit together. Uh, and this is a, a very interesting chapter. Um, and, and folks uh, love antennas. It's probably the number one topic uh, for people to, to, to do their own thing uh, in amateur radio is to build and put up antennas and to try them out. So we've got about 12 participants in our uh, Zoom classroom and uh, about nine folks uh, on YouTube. Uh, glad to have you all along. And of course, if you're watching later on YouTube, uh, we're happy to have you uh, as well. So let's get started. Chapter four, propagation, antennas, and feed lines. And we're going to start with some terms of art. Um, and uh, the first term is uh, the radio horizon. Uh, and uh, there's a URL down here at the bottom of the uh, screen uh, for hamradioschool.com. And I, I love, uh, they uh, have come up with something called the bald earth uh, theory. Uh, and that is if you took all vegetation and all buildings and everything away from the earth, how far away could you transmit with a, a VHF or UHF walkie talkie? And because of the curvature of the Earth, that distance, if you're about six feet tall, is about three and a half miles. And so uh, uh, the radio horizon for a person on the ground is, uh, at best, three and a half miles. Well, let's say if you've got somebody else over here on the other side, and uh, they've got their three and a half miles. So maximum, probably, uh, line of sight on, on flat ground uh, between two walkie-talkies, uh, maximum theoretical is probably seven miles of range uh, for both people uh, to be able to talk to each other. But that doesn't uh, then um, take into account buildings and obstructions and things like that. But I think this is kind of interesting. So we, uh, as we mentioned before, radio waves are electromagnetic waves. Uh, and the range, the, the seven mile theoretical that I just talked about is, is the distance over which a radio transmission can be received. And the radio horizon uh, is the distance uh, over which uh, two stations can communicate uh, by a direct path. Now, on VHF and UHF, you can travel, uh, you can talk much farther than seven miles if somebody is up high. So here we have an example um, on the, the top. Um, we have an antenna tower, and we have a hill in the middle, and we have a receiving point. And the signal is not making it through because it's uh, the direct path, the line of sight, is being blocked by a hill. If you can get the antenna up higher, however, you can go over the obstructions and make it. So uh, this is one way uh, that uh, you can uh, go farther on VHF and above. Um, and some people um, will actually go up into the mountains, especially for uh, VHF and UHF contests, uh, because it enables them to make lots of contacts uh, at long distances on, on VHF and UHF. 
something to know that radio waves refract slightly. Uh, so think about uh, light, you know, how far can you see uh, from a certain point? Uh, and so that's, that's uh, indicated by this blue line that's going out here. Whereas the red line is radio waves on, on the direct path. They will actually slightly bend and go a little bit further along the Earth than um, an optical view would. Um, slightly farther uh, for RF than light because of the wave refracting around the Earth. If you have an obstruction in your way, does it have a sharp edge? Uh, this is something known as knife edge diffraction, uh, and if you can get, you know, beam your radio signal toward that structure, maybe with a directional antenna, and you get a knife edge on that building or mountaintop or whatever, you can sometimes diffract the radio wave down uh, and uh, allow you to talk around things. That's knife edge diffraction for VHF and above radio signals, allowing radio signals to go around barriers. Um, I just want to point out here, this is not an extensive electronics class. This is a, a, an amateur radio licensing class, so the reason we're talking about these things in the order that we are is to help you pass your license test. And then when you get your license, that's when the real learning begins. We say you get a license to learn. So if somebody says, but hey, you're just jumping from you know, point to point, don't worry about it. It makes sense in the context of the license test. All right. Next topic, very important, something called multipath. Uh, and so here we have our transmitter tower over here, and the signal is coming out uh, in uh, all directions. It's an omnidirectional antenna. And part of the signal is coming over to this uh, building over here and is, is being reflected or rebounded. Some of the signal is trying to go direct, but um, it's being blocked by uh, vegetation, so there's some scattering and shadowing of the signal, so the, the signal is not as strong as it would be. Uh, and uh, here we have that diffraction again, the knife edge diffraction. So in this case, for our receiving uh, radio, we're actually receiving the, the radio signal that's being transmitted from three different paths. So you'd think, well, that's, that's all well and good. Well, yeah, except that sometimes uh, that the signals can come in delayed slightly, such that they're out of phase uh, with uh, one another. And when you have two signals in phase, they reinforce each other. But when you have one of them go out of phase, it'll actually cancel. And the signal strength of the received signal will go down to nothing. So um, multipath, usually we're talking about problems. We're talking about um, we can't receive anything. And multipath happens with VHF and UHF, uh, and it happens uh, also with high frequencies. High frequencies. Uh, we'll talk more about that here in a second. So here's a story where we looked at that, and we saw the various ways that signals can be you know, bounced around or um, impeded, etc. Sometimes, so it works out. I used to live in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, uh, and uh, near Paris Mountain, which is a landmark there. Uh, and so here, here is my old house. Let me move there. Okay, there's my old house. Paris Mountain was there, and Channel 7, which was at the time transmitting on VHF Channel 7, was transmitting a TV signal, but Paris Mountain was in the way. And I never could receive channel 7 with my directional TV antenna. But then I had a thought, well, what happens if I turn my antenna away from channel 7 in Spartanburg and point it toward downtown Greenville? And what was happening is the signal from Spartanburg was coming into downtown Greenville, bouncing off the buildings down there, and was able to be received at my house. So these are the things we sometimes have to think about where um, this kind of multi-path activity can be beneficial. You can actually receive something that you might not otherwise be able to, to, to hear. Multi-path is usually talked about in mobile operation. Uh, and again, it's multiple signals that can add or subtract to the sum that the radio receives. And even if you don't have your license yet, I'm sure you've already experienced multipath. 
If you listen to FM radio, you know, you're listening to the music and you're hearing your favorite song and oh, you're coming up to a stoplight, so you got to stop the car and you just get into the good part of the song and all of a sudden as you stop the signal on the FM station, goes away. Huh? That's the good part. What happened? And even then, if you creep the car up another two, three feet, all of a sudden, the signal comes up again. That's multipath. You found a point at which the reflections were coming in and canceling uh, each other. Uh, but if you just move the vehicle forward just a little bit, signal comes back. That's multipath, something you've probably already experienced. As I mentioned, multipath can occur on all frequencies, low frequency, medium frequency, high frequency, VHF, UHF, super high frequencies. On HF, or high frequencies, between 3 and 30 megahertz, multipath is caused by ionospheric reflections. So with uh, high frequency signals, it actually goes up to the ionosphere and comes back down to a receive point. But it may come in various paths, that, that blue line, it may also come uh, in this red line path. And so how they come together and how they, they mix and add or subtract from one another can cause levels to vary on HF. So you'll hear this on the 20 meter band or the, the 40 meter band, for example. Most of us with our technician licenses are going to be operating on VHF and UHF, and we're going to be operating through amateur radio repeaters in our area. And uh, a repeater, as we talked about uh, in one of the earlier classes, is just uh, something that's way up high, maybe a tall tower on a mountaintop or whatever, and with your little uh, HT, you transmit up to the repeater. The repeater repeats it on a slightly different frequency, and it comes back down, so someone else a long distance away uh, can, re can receive you. Repeaters are great. They're wonderful. Precursors to cell phones. This is some of the, the things that got the cell phone uh, um, bandwagon rolling. But multipath. Multipath can occur with signals going to or from a radio repeater. And in fact, you may find in your house, uh, once you get your license and you can operate through repeaters, that you've got one spot in your house where you can hear the radio repeater wonderfully. But if you move three or four feet away, all of a sudden, number one, you can't hear the repeater anymore, or other, you can't get into the repeater. Your transmitted signal won't make it to the repeater because of multipath going in that direction. And you'll hear people on the repeater tell you later, hey, you're off your X, get back to where you need to be in order to get into the repeater. That's multipath. And that's with the FM voice signals that we're talking about, but it also happens with the digital signals. Uh, and so this is uh, an early form of digital communications used by ham radio, a uh, packet radio. Uh, I first got involved with packet radio back in the, the 1980s uh, using a dumb terminal, you remember those, or a computer running terminal software, a terminal node controller, kind of like a radio modem, a radio, and an antenna, and you could connect up to a bulletin board systems. Oh, I'm showing my age. Anyway, when you do this, you're using the radio system to transmit digital signals. Well, with multipath, if you have multipath problems with digital signals, the error rate will go up. And it may be such that you can't even get a signal through because um, the other uh, end is not able to receive uh, your station uh, because of multipath. And again, you probably have to move the antenna or, or change something uh, in order to change the equation uh, regarding multipath. And uh, packet radio was uh, common on VHF and UHF, uh, two meter packet radio, is still being used today as part of the APRS system. We'll be talking more about that in the future. So with VHF and UHF signals, here's a question, well, why is the range greater in the winter than it is in the summer? Well, that is because in the winter, you don't have any leaves on the trees. Whereas in the summer, you most definitely do. And you can have absorption of radio wave signals, especially VHF, UHF, by leaves and other vegetation. So just keep that in mind. 
back in our cars, we're driving along, and uh, somebody uh, tells you, hey, Gary, you're picket fencing. What does that mean, picket fencing? Well, it means that your signal level as you're transmitting from your vehicle into the repeater, for example, is going up and down and up and down and up and down like a picket fence. Your signal's there, then it's not there. Your signal's there, then it's not there. And you will actually hear this uh, on radio repeaters in your area. It's a com completely normal phenomena caused by multipath uh, from, with different reflections from buildings in the area. So a picket fencing uh, is mobile flutter uh, caused by multipath. If you're in a building, uh, you may discover that building penetration uh, is something that you have to be concerned about. And you know what works best in a building? Well, generally, UHF works better if you're going to be inside a building because of the wavelength. Um, so uh, two meters, 144 megahertz, the wavelength of the radio signal is two meters. That's you know, over six feet. Well, um, UHF, 70 centimeters, less than one meter. Uh, the radio wave may actually be able to penetrate or go through windows easier uh, because it's uh, UHF. All right, I haven't put you to sleep yet, hopefully. It's now Gary's story time to illustrate uh, another uh, phenomena. Uh, this is uh, from one of my uh, earlier jobs that I used to have. I used to work as an engineer for the NBC, then NBC TV station, up in Saginaw, Michigan, WNEM. Um, but before that, um, I worked for a PBS uh, TV station uh, at, uh, it was Delta College, I think it's Delta University now, but anyway, uh, PBS did a wonderful thing back uh, in the, the 80s, 70s and 80s. Uh, Instead of paying AT&T long lines to send their network signals via microwave, which was the standard at the time, they said, no, we're going to put up, um, we're going to buy time on a satellite. We're going to put up our own satellite antennas at our uh, stations, and we're going to distribute our signals via satellite. And they put in some very large uh, six meter antennas because they were on uh, what they call C band or but three to four gigahertz. That's important in a second. And they did. They put a, a nationwide distribution system for a PBS and for NPR and whatnot on C band satellite. I think it still exists, but I have no idea. NBC said, oh, that makes a lot of sense. We can save a lot of money. We don't have to rent microwave lines from the phone companies. Um, let's put in our own system. The problem was that um, NBC decided we're going to use KU band because we can use smaller antennas. So this antenna might be uh, maybe uh, two meters or three meters wide. And this is a typical installation uh, back in the day. And um, Okay, all well and good, but note here, the frequencies, instead of being 3 to 4 gigahertz, are 11 to 14 gigahertz. And remember we talked about wavelength and frequency? The higher you go in frequency, the smaller the wavelength. And so the wavelength of those signals was much smaller than the PBS uh, system, you know, really small. And so uh, we, we were dealing with the, the wavelength for KU band of like one to two and a half centimeters. The DISH network or um, uh, direct TV uh, antenna, if you have one of those on your house, it's also a KU band antenna. And you may have already experienced this rain fade. Um, what ha would happen is if it would rain in Saginaw, Michigan heavily, our network signal would go away. Uh, or even worse, if it would uh, rain at the uplink, and I think it was Stamford, Connecticut, all the network 
around the United States would go away because of rain fade. The rain droplets were um, uh, such an impediment to KU band signals that the signal strength would fall off. So that's something just to, to be aware of. It can happen at these, these ultra high frequencies, very small wavelengths. Now, here's a test question. What are the effects of fog and light rain on six and 10 meter bands? Well, these aren't microwave frequencies. The six meter band has a, a wavelength of six meters, or the 10 meter band, it's 10 meter, 33 feet. So the answer to the trick question is, what effect does fog or rain have? None, no effect whatsoever, because six and 10 meter wavelengths are, are too long to be impacted by the water molecules in fog or rain. So you can transmit uh, on those bands without any um, impediment uh, with uh, fog or rain. Road trip. Anybody taking a road trip across the United States, uh, especially if you're driving at night and uh, listen on the AM broadcast band? That's one of the reasons I got involved in radio is because at night I would listen to the AM broadcast band and be able to hear stations. I was up in Michigan, where I'm from originally, and I'd be able to hear stations in New York or New Orleans or you know, far. How did that happen? I couldn't hear them during the day, but I could hear them at night. Or if you're doing that cross-country road trip, you can listen to stations all around the United States. And it has to do with signal distribution on medium wave, uh, ground wave versus sky wave. They're two different modes of propagation. And during the day from the antenna tower, the vertical antenna tower on the, the medium wave band, the ground wave signal is predominant uh, and uh, can go out maybe 60, 70 miles. Uh, and so uh, that's all well and good. There is also a sky wave component, but during the day, that's absorbed by the ionosphere. We'll talk more about that. So during the day, only the ground wave uh, gets the signal out. But at night, the ionosphere stops absorbing the sky wave signal, and at night, the sky wave signal can go up to the ionosphere and down and actually go thousands of miles uh, you know, much farther than the ground wave signal. But the ground wave signal actually travels along the surface of the Earth, uh, and it actually kind of tilts the wave so it can go around the, the curvature of the Earth. These are AM radio stations during the day using vertical antennas. Uh, and here's a, another slide that depicts the, the tilting action of the radio wave until it finally is absorbed totally by the Earth. Uh, itself. So uh, signals up to about 2 megahertz, which includes the amateur radio 160 meter band, um, can utilize ground wave propagation during the day and sky wave propagation at night. So I mentioned the ionosphere. Sky wave uses the layers of the ionosphere. And so where is the ionosphere? Well, so here's the Earth, and above it is the troposphere. Tropopause, stratosphere, the ozone layer, the mesosphere, and at the very top, uh, the uh, layers of the atmosphere, at the very top is the ionosphere. And that's where radio signals can be propagated from, uh, and depending on the frequency and the time of day. So from our medium wave station, our, our WBZ in Boston or WJR up in Detroit, you know, they've got their radio transmitting tower uh, and they're, they're sending the signal out during the day on ground wave. And they're trying to send a signal out during the day, but the D layer, the lowest layer of the ionosphere, there's the D, the E, and the F layer. The D layer absorbs the sky wave signal coming from a medium wave station uh, below two megahertz. And so that's why during the day you only have the ground wave signal. Whereas at night, this is because of the sun. The sun is out and it's energizing the layers of the ionosphere. But at night the sun isn't there. And so the layers of the ionosphere are no longer energized. Uh, 
and signals can travel up to it and back down hundreds if not thousands of miles away, which is how you uh, can get the long distance radio reception on the medium wave band. Here's another way to look at it. Um, during the day, we have a D layer, an E layer, an F1 layer, and above that, the F2 layer. Whereas at night, you have the F layer kind of mixes together and maybe a little bit of the E layer, but the D layer goes away. Uh, so these are the, the ionospheric sublayers that radio uses for long distance propagation. The E layer is kind of interesting. Um, because that's where, and it's kind of still unknown, and this is uh, amazing because you know, we're in the modern 21st century, but we still have things to learn about radio. Uh, there are what are known as E-clouds, uh, gaseous clouds uh, of ionized material that form in the E-layer of the ionosphere. Uh, and they, they come and go. They don't last probably more than 15, 20 minutes. But you can bounce VHF, like six meter radio signals, off an E cloud and have it come down hundreds, if not thousands, of miles away. I remember my first uh, uh, six meter uh, contact on single sideband phone uh, from my uh, radio station over in Greenville to California via an E-layer cloud. So that's that's kind of neat. It's called sporadic E propagation because it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, and uh, it's really kind of magical uh, when you can get a radio to propagate that way. Remember, this is the first part of this chapter, propagation. So radio waves go up to the ionosphere, but there are some limits. Below one particular frequency, the refraction or reflection occurs. It goes up and comes back down. But at one particular frequency, the radio wave will be bent slightly, but not come back down to the Earth. It'll, it'll go out into space. That is called the critical frequency. Below the critical frequency, radio waves will be reflected back to Earth. Above the critical frequency, it'll go out into space, which is the reason why NASA uses VHF and UHF to communicate to the International Space Station or when we had the moon landings going on. It was VHF and UHF because those signals go directly through the ionosphere and not be refracted because they're well above the critical frequency. So my favorite thing to do in ham radio is to talk internationally to stations that are way far away. I was trying for a station in Nepal the other day. I could hear him, but he couldn't hear me. It was frustrating. It was, you know, but it had to do with propagation and also my antenna height and, and, and whatnot. But whoops, let me push the right button. There we go. So the ionosphere makes that magic of long distance radio propagation. Uh, and uh, so, you know, here we have a, a signal coming from, from this location and can take one hop. It can take multiple hops around uh, the world. So uh, going to Nepal on the 20 meter band, I'm sure I was hearing a multi-hop signal coming back to me. Uh, and he just wasn't able to hear my signal going to him. and. It's the sun. The sun is the uh, primary factor uh, in how the ionosphere uh, works with radio waves. And it happens in an 11 year cycle uh, due to sunspots. And sunspots are literally that, spots that appear on the sun. Uh, and you can see here, here's 2019. That was a, a very, sorry, poor time for amateur radio long distance propagation because we had no sunspots. There were, the sun had none. And so some of the high frequency bands, the 15 meter and the 10 meter HF bands had no long distance propagation. They need sunspots. They need daylight for ionization and they need sunspots. Well, look, that was 2019. We're in 2024. We're approaching the peak of the sunspot cycle. And I can tell you right now, radio frequency propagation on the high frequency bands is excellent. And uh, 50 meters and 10 meters uh, can be open worldwide. Uh, you don't need a lot of power. Uh, and uh, it's just a lot of fun to get a signal out uh, and back uh, that long distance. All because of the sun 
and sunspots. And, and you know, like I said, sunspots are, are just that. There are these dark areas on the surface of the sun. The high frequency bands, uh, six Thank meters. And, yes, go ahead. Was there a question? I just want to let you know that the bandwidth on the on the Zoom call is very low, so those watching on the Zoom call uh, can't see a lot of your hand motions nor the uh, laser pointer. Okay, is that is that for yes, everyone or is that just for one person? Everybody's talked about it on the Zoom call. The YouTube stream looks good. <laughs> well, I don't know how I can fix that. Ah, I see if there's a bunch of comments in the chat. I didn't have the chat open. I'm a one-man band tonight. Um, so... Huh. Yeah, I just wanted you to be aware. Of it. Okay, well, I apologize, and if, and if you need to go back on the on the YouTube uh, and take a look at the the recording again, my apologies. You can hear me okay, though, right? I think that's yes. a, yeah. Okay, thank At you. Times it gets kind of spotty, but for the most part, it's good. Okay, well, apparently we're having a an internet issue, which um, I is out of my control. Although I have not seen any errors on the YouTube stream, that's interesting. So anyway, well, let's carry on. Hopefully, it'll get better. I apologize. Um, we uh, had our class last night and didn't have any issues. So. Uh, <laughs> Lucky us. <laughs> Technical problems. Uh, by the way, the reason I'm a one-man band tonight is because Bruce would normally be back uh, uh, at the, uh, the switchers back there pushing the buttons. My friend Bruce, though, is out with the flu tonight, so all sorts of stuff going around. So Anyway, let's, let's carry on, and hopefully things will get better here. And again, my apologies. Um, the uh, high-frequency HF bands, 6 and 10 meters, benefit uh, from sunspots. Uh, you can even get a little 10 meter handy talkie uh, and, and talk around the world when you have sunspots. Uh, and it's long distance propagation uh, during daylight hours with high sunspot numbers for the 6 and 10 meter bands. So uh, daytime, uh, 28 megahertz or 10 meter propagation is largely up from a transmitter up into the F2, or the highest layer, and it comes back down. Uh, and uh, so the long distance propagation uh, uses the ionosphere uh, to make it happen. Now sometimes, in some situations, you don't need to go thousands of miles, and you, you want, though, reliable communications. And there is a, a mode of propagation called tropospheric uh, communications, which when I worked for the Voice of America, they used to use in the Philippines. This uh, predates satellites. Uh, so with tropospheric communications, uh, we say think tropical or think thermal layers. It's reliable communications out to a distance of about thr 300 miles. Uh, using um, uh, VHF, uh, I think it was uh, 300 uh, megahertz. Uh, this is before satellites, although these antennas for tropospheric communications look very much like satellite antennas, except they're pointed at the horizon. Uh, and uh, VOA used to use it from a receiver site in Baguio, up in the mountains, uh, to Poro Point, where there was a transmitter site, uh, reliable communications over a 50 kilometer distance using tropospheric communications. So that, that's one form of tropospheric communications. Another can happen even on the two meter bands via thermal inversion. Normally uh, close to the earth we have warm air and then colder air up above, whereas um, with a thermal inversion you can have a, a layer of warm air uh, surrounded by cold air on the top and, and bottom. Uh, and this warm air in the middle can act as a duct for radio frequency signals. So usually in the spring and in the fall, you may be monitoring your local ham radio repeater, and you may hear signals coming in into your repeater from hundreds of miles away. Uh, it usually happens in the spring and the fall, these thermal uh, uh, inversions, uh, also a form of tropospheric uh, communications. 
I know we're jumping around to a lot of different uh, things here, so just hang in there. Backscatter propagation. Uh, this involves the ionosphere uh, from a transmitter that goes up to the ionosphere and you know maybe goes thousands of miles away, but some of the signal comes back toward uh, the the area here, which normally wouldn't receive any signal. Uh, this is called backscatter uh, communication, it's, and it's via a partial reflection. Uh, so uh, just know about backscatter. Finally, uh, meteor scatter. Um, on the six meter bands, yes, we can actually bounce signals off of meteors uh, that are coming toward the Earth, uh, and uh, the six meter wavelength the wavelength of a six meter signal matches the nominal size of meteor trails. So 50 megahertz signals uh, work well with meteors um, and it, you know, people use uh, high speed Morse code or digital forms uh, to send uh, communications on uh, meteor trails. Another one is auroral uh, transmission. Uh, this uses the northern lights if we have uh, an event uh, that uh, um, starts uh, with the northern lights. You can actually beam radio waves to the north, for us, uh, into the aurora and bounce signals off of that. So I'm going to turn on or original sound here on Zoom so this sounds normal. As soon as I find my cursor, there it is. All right, original sound. And I want you to listen here, uh, to listen to this is the sound of auroral communications. It sounds kind of horrible, but listen and you'll hear call signs being exchanged and signal reports and uh, grid squares. Five and eight, Aurora. Five and eight, Aurora. Fox, November three, two. Uh, call is Kilo Charlie two. Whiskey Lima Radio Aurora. Yeah, QSL, nice to see you again and beautiful signal on the Aurora 5 and 9 Aurora here. 59 Aurora, Fox Norway 25, over. QSL, Kevin, you're also 59, 59, 73, thank you. 73 and good luck, Victor Echo 3, Echo November, I'm going to QSY up 5. Changing his radio frequency. Okay, QRZ, QRZ, Victor Echo 3, Echo November, Victor Echo 3, Echo November, QRZ. Alpha Alpha 1 Tango Tango, nice to see you, nice signal, 5 and 7, 57 Aurora, Fox Norway 25, Fox November 25, over. Yeah, it's just Alpha, it's copy 5 and 8 Aurora, into the Fox Trot, November 33, FX 33, over. QSL, thanks for Fox November 33 and enjoy the opening, we're a lot of strong signals out there. Um, Alpha Alpha 1 Tango Tango, Victor Echo 3, Echo November 73. So with your technician license, you're going to be able to do that if you wanted to. Uh, transmit uh, on uh, 50 megahertz on 6 meters uh, up to an aurora uh, and uh, hear uh, signals kind of like that. It's kind of, you know, freaky, but um, you can do it. All right, more uh, sporadic E. We talked about it with the E clouds uh, that appear uh, and 10, 6, and 2 meters are the likely bands to have sporadic E propagation. Uh, and uh, it's kind of magic, and like I say, it only lasts for maybe 15 to 20 minutes, uh, and then uh, the cloud dissipates, and you can't make that uh, contact anymore. So um, get it while you can. Um, critical frequencies, we talked about the critical frequency, uh, where anything above that will go out into space. Also, um, Scientists have developed uh, parameters called the lowest usable frequency and the maximum usable frequency. And these can be calculated uh, on a day uh, by day basis uh, between two points. Uh, and uh, uh, it varies by the time of day and the direction of the signal. Um, higher HF ham bands, so like 10 meters, work better during the day for distant transmission. 
whereas lower uh, HF bands work uh, better at uh, night. Uh, because they're in, and they're also independent of uh, sunspot numbers. You'll learn much more about the muff and the luff uh, in the general class and in the extra class. And there's software online that you can actually run to calculate when's the best time for me to be able to hear that station in Nepal, for example. There's a special time between uh, uh, sunlight and darkness. Uh, and that's called the gray line. So if the sun is up on one part of the Earth and, and down on the other, the, the terminator between the two here is called the gray line. It moves uh, because the Earth is rotating. And uh, what happens is that you can uh, have radio signals traverse this gray line. So here, for example, the western United States might have a really good shot at getting a signal into Eastern Europe or the Russia Asiatic area because of gray line propagation. And that software I mentioned, actually courtesy of your tax dollars at work, the Voice of America coverage area prediction software uh, is available online. It's the same VOA that I used to work for uh, because we were in, very much interested in delivering radio frequency signals to a target area uh, and getting signals through. So we would uh, predict and um, learn uh, about the ionosphere and, and make sure that we put our signals on the right frequencies at the right time. The sun uh, is the, the predominant uh, influencer of um, how well radio propagation is going to work. Uh, and you can find various online research, uh, resources um, from um, uh, DX spotting uh, clusters like DX heat, uh, spaceweather.com, solarham.com. And did you know we have our own weather woman? The space weather woman. Dr. Tamitha Scove, uh, on the left there, she does a weather forecast and uh, tells uh, how radio frequency propagation is going to be for both commercial uh, users and for hams. And you can find that uh, in her YouTube channel. Just go to spaceweatherwoman.com. All right, if anybody is still with us on uh, Zoom, I think what I'm going to do at the break uh, is I'm going to log off of Zoom and log back in again and see if it gets any better for you. But if you can, uh, unmute and let's see uh, how we do uh, with these various questions. So why do VHF signal strengths sometimes vary greatly when the antenna is moved only a few feet? Charlie. You see that? Charlie, multipath propagation cancels or reinforces signals. That's correct. And what is the effect of vegetation on UHF and microwave signals? Bravo. I heard bravo. bravo. Yep, and that's correct. Absorption. And what is the meaning of the term picket fencing? Bravo. Yes, it's rapid flutter on mobile signals due to multipath. And what weather conditions might decrease range at microwave frequencies? Think of NBC and their KU band system, yet precipitation. And what is a likely cause of irregular fading of signals propagated by the ionosphere? Delta. It's another term for multipath. It's random combining of signals arriving via different paths. And what effect does multipath propagation have on data transmissions? Gold. Yep, error rates are likely to increase. And which region of the atmosphere can refract or bend HF and VHF radio waves? Which, 
Where does the magic happen? It happens in the ionosphere. That's Charlie, yes. And remember, these are the actual questions and actual answers that will be on your test. Just the answers are going to be in a different order. I can guarantee that. So what is the effect of fog and rain on signals in the 10 meter and 6 meter bands? Problem. Yep, there is no effect because their wavelength is so much bigger than the rain droplets. And why are simplex UHF signals rarely heard beyond their radio horizon? Charlie. Sure. Yep, UHF signals are above the critical frequency. They're uh, usually not propagated at all via the ionosphere. So what is the characteristic of HF communications compared with communications on VHF and higher? Charlie. Yeah, long distance ionospheric propagation is far more common on high frequency. And what is the characteristic of VHF signals received via auroral backscatter? You heard it. At least I hope you heard it. Bro. Yes, they are distorted, and the signal strength varies considerably. And which of the following types of propagation is most commonly associated with occasional strong signals on the 10, 6, and 2 meter bands from beyond the radio horizon? My 6 meter signal out Bro. to California was via uh, an E cloud, sporadic E. And which of the following effects may allow radio signals to travel beyond obstructions between the transmitting and receiving stations? Alpha. I like quantum tunneling. I wish we could do that, but alpha. no, you're right. It is knife edge diffraction, alpha, indeed. So what type of propagation is responsible for allowing over the horizon VHF and UHF communications to ranges of approximately 300 miles on a regular basis? It's what VOA did in the Philippines. Alpha. They pointed their antennas at the horizon and used tropospheric ducting to get their signals through. And what band is best suited for communicating via meteor scatter? Bravo. Yep, its wavelength is about the same as the tail of the meteors, the six meters. And what causes tropospheric ducting? Think tropical, think thermal. Delta? Yep, temperature inversions in the atmosphere. And what is generally the best time for long distance 10 meter band propagation via the F region? So the 10 meter band needs sunlight and it works best alpha. if you you got high sunspot numbers. So it is an alpha from dawn to shortly after sunset during periods of high sunspot activity is the, the best for 10 meter band propagation. And which of the following bands may provide long distance communications via the ionosphere's F region during the peak of the sunspot cycle?
Alpha. Oh. Yes, yeah, six and ten meters. All right, why is the radio horizon for VHF and UHF signals more distant than the visual horizon? Charlie? Yep, the atmosphere reflects or refracts radio waves slightly. So normally I would go on to section 4.2 right now, but because we're having technical problems on Zoom, what I'm going to propose uh, is that we take our five minute break right now. Uh, I'm going to try to maybe log off of uh, Zoom and log back in again, maybe get a better connection. Uh, we'll f fingers crossed. So let's take our five minute break right now and uh, then we'll be back.
welcome back. And I'm told that was the right call. <laughs> I uh, logged out of our Zoom classroom and uh, logged back in. And uh, apparently my video quality on Zoom has improved. As I was commenting uh, to the class, we've never had that problem before. <laughs> There's always something new that's going to crop up. But thank you. On YouTube, you couldn't see anything of, the, of that that was going on. Um, yay, YouTube. Um, anyway, let's continue on here uh, and uh, carry on with Section 4.2, uh, which has to do with antenna and radio wave basics. Uh, and the most basic kind of antenna that you're going to see is this. It's the half-wave dipole antenna. Let me turn on my laser pointer. Hopefully folks on Zoom can see it again. There we are. And so we have a, an antenna feed line, usually coaxial cable uh, in ham radio stations. Uh, and we have an insulator here uh, at the center. And we have one wire that goes out a quarter of a wavelength long on one side and a quarter of a wavelength long on the other side. And again, you have insulators out here at the end and this is known as, because it's a quarter wave plus a quarter wave, a half wave dipole antenna. Uh, and uh, even the big antennas, the Yagi's and other things that we'll talk about, use the half wave dipole uh, as their driven element. So it's a, it's a very common, very popular antenna. Uh, and you can also build your own uh, based ar around this design. So as we mentioned, uh, radio waves are electromagnetic waves, uh, and they actually have uh, um, two different fields, an electric field and a magnetic field. And the two work together, and you can see in this animation, uh, they are at right angles to each other, uh, and at the antenna, they work together to create a radio wave that propagates away from the antenna. Uh, so uh, I like this visual. There's also this visual, um, which I, I like less, but um, it just shows you the, the orientation of the electric field and the magnetic field. They're at 90 degrees to each other. Uh, and uh, they go uh, up and down uh, in synchronization. So antenna polarization, when we talk about what, you know, how is an antenna polarized, number one, it corresponds to the electric field, not the magnetic field. Uh, and it also is the, the orientation of the antenna. So half-wave dipole antennas out like this, if you can see me here. <laughs> This is my dipole antenna. This would be a horizontally polarized antenna, horizontally polarized. Whereas a, a vertical antenna, this, this would be up and down like that. So it it's the, corresponds to the electric field and also the physical orientation uh, of the antenna. That's antenna polarization. And here, Here's another look at that. Uh, horizontal polarization here on the left and a vertical polarization here on the right. And these are both half-wave dipole antennas, a horizontal dipole and a vertical dipole here. So what do you think? Which way are car antennas polarized? Anybody want to unmute and, and give me an answer? Vertical. Yep. Car antennas are vertically polarized. So you can see they're, they're sticking up in a vertical orientation. So for these antennas, the electric field is also vertically polarized and the physical orientation is vertical. Uh, we'll go into uh, where the other half of the half-wave dipole is on these in here in a second. So if you want to work weak signals on V, and these are VHF and UHF antennas primarily, if you want to work weak signal VHF and UHF uh, from home, a good engineering rule of thumb is to use the opposite polarization so you won't be interfered uh, with from the, the strong mobile signals. Uh, so uh, this is a, a standard that weak signal VHF and UHF beams use horizontal polarization. So here, here is a um, um, Yagi uh, antenna for a VHF or UHF. Here's a, a half-wave dipole that is the driven element, and we have a reflector and multiple director elements. We'll talk more about these here in, in a second. VHF and UHF beams using horizontal polarization. 
And now horizontal and vertical polarization actually came into play also in satellite systems, uh, especially the early ones uh, used in Europe. Uh, they had low noise block converters uh, that were very uh, inexpensive. And inside they had a horizontal probe and they had a vertical probe, and the satellite operators could actually then uh, double their channel capacity on their uh, satellites uh, by using uh, the uh, horizontal and vertical polarizations because there's about a hundred to a thousand times difference in signal strength between the two polarizations uh, at, at, on the satellite systems and usually the KU band. Now on HF, on high frequencies, remember 3 to 30 megahertz, when you're sending from your transmitter, uh, from your antenna, let's say it's a horizontally polarized antenna, and you transmit up to the ionosphere, what happens is that on the downward path, the signal tumbles. It becomes an elliptical wave coming down, and it doesn't matter. The receive antenna here for HF can be either vertical or horizontal. There isn't that 100 to 1,000 times difference that we saw on the satellite with the ionosphere tumbling the signal, creating that elliptical wave. Both horizontal and vertically polarized antennas work interchangeably on HF. So now I'm going to show you an antenna that cannot be built, but it's an engineering standard, and it's called an isotropic radiator. It's a point source antenna, uh, and uh, it's uh, theoretical in that it radiates equally well in all directions. We can't build it on Earth and even in space because of reflections, but it does provide uh, an engineering reference. So this is an isotropic radiator. And um, to get gain from an antenna, you must control the pattern of that antenna. Uh, I say you kind of squish the pattern of the antenna into a certain shape and that allows you to get gain from an antenna. Uh, and gain is measured in decibels, we'll talk about that here in a second, uh, and the reference standard that they might use to measure against could be that isotropic radiator. One type of a gain antenna is known as a beam antenna. Uh, it's an antenna that uh, has a, a half-wave driven, driven element here, this is for UHF, a reflector in this case, and then multiple directors going off. So it's directional. This antenna is directional in this direction. Uh, Yagi antennas are the most popular kind of beam antennas, and that comes from a scientist in Japan, Yagi, and, and his assistant, Uda. So technically, it should be called the Yagi Uda antenna, except that Mr. Yagi uh, decided that he was going to take all the credit. <laughs> if you want to hear more about it, you can go to this URL and get the true story uh, of the Yagi antenna. But hams use Yagi antennas a lot. Uh, here, for example, is a six meter Yagi antenna with a half wave driven element at the center an element behind it that is about 5% longer, this is called a reflector, the, the signal from this antenna comes here and is reflected, and then this is called a director, it's about 5% shorter than the driven element. So in this case, this Yagi antenna is directional off in this direction. And you can have them vertically oriented, or you can have them horizontally oriented, uh, and they can be for VHF, UHF, and also for high frequency bands, uh, the 3 to 30 megahertz. Now, the low frequency antennas, like for 40 meters, which would be um, 3 to 4 megahertz, those are huge, and most people cannot uh, put those up anywhere. But there are some who have put them up, and you can find a uh, look up on YouTube, 80-meter uh, Yagi or 80-meter beam. They're massive structures. So I mentioned that isotropic radiator. That's a reference antenna that engineers can use. Uh, it's a point source antenna. Then we have our old friend, the half-wave dipole antenna. That's uh, another that can be used as a reference standard uh, when we're measuring gain of uh, like Yagi antennas. Uh, and gain, as I mentioned, is measured in decibels uh, against a reference. And there's a, a formula that you can use uh, here, uh, 10 log to the base 10 
P2 over P1. Okay, we're not going to go into that here in the technician class, but know that uh, if an antenna has 3 dB of gain, it's the equivalent of two times the power. So if you put 100 watts into an antenna with 3 dB of gain, it's the equivalent of sending out 200 watts uh, in that particular direction that the antenna has gain. So 3 dB is two times, 6 dB is four times gain, and 10 dB is 10 times gain. Uh, it's a logarithmic relationship. Uh, a 1 dB is only about a 20% increase, uh, um, but then as we go up, it goes substantially larger. But these are the three that you need to know with the arrows here. 3 dB, 2 times, 6 dB, 4 times, 10 dB, 10 times. And if you have a high-frequency receiver, it probably has on it an S meter, which is received signal strength. Uh, here we have um, S9, and above S9, it's actually calibrated in decibels. Uh, below S9, it's calibrated in what they call S units, and a standard S meter, uh, 6 dB, is one S unit. Now, there are some variations from manufacturer to manufacturer, but that is the standard. So an omnidirectional antenna with a vertical polarization uh, is like a big donut. It's going out in all directions from the, the vertical antenna here in the middle. Um, a Yagi Uda antenna uh, has a directional pattern something like this. And you can see here we've got the main lobe. This is where the gain is. This is the, where the antenna is pointed. Uh, the main lobe, the back lobe. Uh, so there is some uh, gain toward the back, but not as much. There are some side lobes and some nulls in there as well. So it's kind of a complex pattern. You can use computers to model uh, antennas with uh, various uh, uh, element lengths and spacing. Uh, so you have the main lobe, the side lobes, the nulls, and the ratio of gain in the forward, forward direction versus the opposite. It's called the front-to-back ratio. Uh, and you'll see uh, antennas that are calibrated uh, give you uh, specifications as to the antenna's front to back ratio. That means how well will it reject signals coming from the back uh, when you're pointed you know, in another direction. So our old friend, the dipole antenna, normally we want to have it up about a half of a wavelength high, but when a dipole antenna is brought below that, then what happens is the antenna's azimuth is elevated. So instead of going out horizontally, it actually goes more up into the sky and then down, which, okay, it's, that works fine, and, and a lot of times you can't get low-frequency antennas up high enough, but uh, they work. Um, they just may not work as well as if you got them higher up. But you can use this characteristic to your advantage. If you purposely take the antenna and bring it down even lower, well, what happens is the antenna pattern goes almost straight up. And what this is is called a near vertical incident sky wave antenna, a Nivis antenna. The military uses them uh, tactically in the mountains because this kind of an antenna, uh, can, you can shoot up to the ionosphere and have signals refracted back down on the other side of a mountain, for example, uh, and you can have tactical communications then, whereas a VHF, UHF signal would be blocked by the mountain. So this is a Nivis antenna. Preppers <laughs> also are very much into Nivis antennas. All right, we're going to try this again. Uh, some more questions for section point. But yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the Zoom, Zoom stuff has dropped, dropped again. again. Oh no! All right. But, well, okay. I'm gonna now that we know that there was a a, a fix. I'm gonna uh, please uh, on YouTube. Uh, bear with us. I'm gonna go out of uh, the Zoom classroom and come back in again. Hopefully, it'll fix itself again. Okay. Sign and leave. All right. Let's see. So at home, you can actually see what I'm doing. I'm going to log back in. And I'm going to reclaim the host. I'm going to go out big. 
I'm going to unmute myself. All right, I am back. Can you hear me? Yes. And uh, is it working better? Yeah. Yeah, you sound better. Yeah, we can see you moving. <laughs> okay. Yikes. Okay. All right. Um, well, I'm going to spotlight me again here. Let me go back to Switcher 1 so the folks on uh, YouTube are seeing that. All right. And let's go ahead and answer some questions. Fingers crossed this will stay together. All right. So what happens when antennas at opposite ends of a VHF or UHF line of sight radio link are not using the same polarization? For VHF and UHF, Probably. it's critical. Received Probably. signal strength will Probably. be reduced, yes, by 20 to 30 dB or 100 to 1,000 times. So you got to have the right polarity for VHF and UHF. And which of the following results from the fact that signals propagated by the ionosphere are elliptically polarized? So here we're on HF. We're transmitting up to the ionosphere. Probably. Yes, either vertically or horizontally polarized antennas may be used because it's tumbling the polarization, so they'll both work equally well. So what is the relationship between the electric and magnetic fields of an electromagnetic waves? wave? They are at right angles. Indeed, they are at right angles with each other. And what property of a radio wave defines its polarization? Alpha. It, yeah, it is the orientation of the electric field. Yep. And what are the two components of a radio wave? Electric and magnetic fields. Correct. Electric Charlie. and magnetic fields, Charlie, indeed. All right. Which, which decibel value most closely represents a power increase from 5 watts to 10 watts? And I just got a warning that says my internet connection is unstable on the Zoom. Let me know if I drop yes, out. Yes, it is. That would be 3 dB. 3 dB from 5 to 10. That's times 2. Um, how is Zoom holding in there? Is it okay? Uh, it's, it's, it's on the downhill slide. <laughs> oh, no. All right. All right. Let me, well, we're learning something tonight. So folks at home, um, th this is what it looks like uh, in the classroom here. Uh, what I'm going to do is remove Spotlight. I am going to hit End. I'm going to leave the meeting again, assign a host temporarily. I don't know why this is going on. I'm going to restart. Whoops. I'm going to reclaim host. I'm going to unmute. A lot of stuff you got to do here that is not helping. Okay, so hopefully I'm back. Okay, so I'm nodding head. That's good. I'm going to spotlight for everyone. I'm going to go back over here on YouTube. All right, so um, now our question is, which decibel value most closely represents a power decrease from 12 watts to 3 watts? I'm going to go with C. Charlie. Gray. Yep. Minus 6 dB. It's, you're dividing by 4 in this case. And, which, and that's the minus. The minus means you're going down. So which decibel value represents a power increase from 20 watts to 200 watts? 10 decibels. 10 dB. 10 times. Indeed. 
And what is antenna gain? A. No. No. Charlie. I can see where you could get A, but it is Charlie. It's the increase in signal strength in a specified direction compared to a reference antenna. Remember, we can use the isotropic radiator um, as a reference, or we could even use the dipole uh, as a reference. And you'll see manufacturers use either or. All right, let's carry on. Keep our fingers crossed that Zoom hangs in there. S section 4.3, feed lines and standing wave ratio. So... Um, Transmitting system components, like your, your transceiver, for example, or feed line or antennas, have nominal impedances. And impedance, remember, is the resistance or the, the um, opposition to AC current flow or, or RF current flow. So typical transceivers and transmitters have a 50 ohm output impedance. Feed lines are typically 50 ohms, although they could be 30, 75 ohms or 300 or 450. And antennas uh, have a feed point impedance as well. And impedance matching between these parts provides for the maximum of transfer of power. So uh, you, you want them all to be the same, if at all possible. And I'm going to go ahead and hit... Oh, I can't do that. Hang on. <laughs> I'm hearing myself come back. Let me... Uh, I'm going to mute you all. Okay, apologize for the echo there. Okay, whoops. If you would mute yourself if you're not, if you're um, not. Okay, good, thank you. Okay. All right, that prevents that long delayed echo. All right, um, so impedance, remember, it's, uh, we're not going to go deep into it, uh, but it's a vector sum of resistance uh, and reactants, either could be inductive reactants or capacitive reactants. Uh, we don't need to know about that here in the technician class, but that's what impedance is. It's a combination of resistance and reactance. So feed line impedances, 50 ohms is the most common. Coaxial cable, 50 ohms. Uh, nearly all uh, amateur radio stations use this in, in some way or another. Um, Air-insulated hard line uh, is probably the best lowest loss uh, feed line, although it's kind of difficult to use. Ladder line uh, and twin lead, the old TV twin lead are, can also be used as well. 450 ohm or 300 ohm uh, twin lead, and this is what they look like, the coaxial cable, which is the same thing that you would have for cable TV, uh, either that's 75 ohms, but hams use 50 ohm. 300 ohm twin lead uh, and ladder line looks like that. And so we want to impedance match the output of our transmitter to the feed line to the antenna. Uh, and uh, the half wave dipole antenna typically has a feed point impedance here of about 73 ohms, which is an okay match uh, to 50 ohm coaxial cable. That, it'll work good just fine. So impedance matching allows us to have the maximum transfer of power. Now, feed line losses, um, you know, coaxial cable isn't perfect, and it shows up as loss in the cable, and it shows up as a, a heating of the, the cable. The cable will actually get slightly warmer because of the radio frequency energy that you're putting through it uh, that can't get to the other end uh, because of the characteristics of the cable. So the number one rule for coaxial cable is to keep it dry. Moisture creates all of the problems uh, in coaxial cable, by and, by and large. So uh, if you can put you know, good solid connectors on and wrap it up with electrical tape or other materials, uh, bituminous rubber or coax seal or something else, keep water out of coax cable and it'll last a really long time. Now broadcasters, especially for high power television and FM, they use air insulated hard line. Uh, and uh, this is a, a good system uh, because it's the lowest loss, so you won't have a lot of heat uh, build up in the line. But the thing you have to do is you've got to keep moisture out of it. And you do it by pressurizing the interior part of the line using either nitrogen 
or dry air, special uh, air dryers. Uh, so special characteristics and techniques must be used if you're going to use air insulated hard line, but it is the lowest loss. No matter what kind of uh, cable you're going to use, coax or um, open wire or uh, um, what have you, as the frequency goes up, power loss will also go up. So this is a, a typical graph here of, of loss, cable loss in decibels and frequency. And as the frequency increase increases, the loss goes up. Uh, and uh, some cable types have lower losses than others. So that's why you want to look and see what frequency you're going to be operating on and see what kind of cable is going to work best for you. Um, smaller, thinner cable like this RG58 cable um, versus uh, RG213. Uh, RG213 is going to have lower losses than the RG58 at all frequencies. The bigger cable in this case is better. So I said that you know impedance matching is is you know, about getting the maximum power transfer, and, and so when all of the impedance are this are the same, the source impedance 50 ohms, let's say, the characteristic impedance of the transmission line is 50 ohms, and the the load the antenna is 50 ohms, then you'll get the maximum transfer of power. Uh, what happens though is if they're mismatched, well, think of a wave. Uh, as it comes from the ocean and crashes against the shore, you're going to get a rebound, a rebounding wave. Uh, and it may not be readily apparent to the eye, but that's what happens. And the same thing happens with a, a pulse that goes out. Uh, and if there's a large impedance mismatch, the the energy, all of the energy, unless this is an open circuit, uh, is being rebounded back toward the transmitter. So that's a full reflection, 100% reflection. That's an open circuit. Most of the time it's not that. Most of the time you get a partial reflection. So you see some of the energy is, is going out to our antenna. That's great, being radiated uh, out into the air. But some of it is being sent back toward the transmitter. Uh, and uh, so this is a partially uh, rebounding wave. Um, Here's a, a, another look at a, a partial reflection, much like we just saw. This is from a high impedance, 50 ohms, to a low impedance. So, and you see that the polarity of the signal changed. Uh, and so that's when you're going from high impedance to low. Uh, when you're going from low to high, uh, you get a reflection, but the, impedance, the uh, um, uh, polarity does not change, is what I'm trying to say. And hitting an open circuit, we saw this earlier, all of the energy comes back. Hitting a short circuit at the other end, where it's just connected together, uh, all of the energy comes back, but it's in reverse polarity. Well, that's not what we want. We want, don't want any of those things. What we want is this condition, where the energy is coming from left to right, it's going out, it's going to our antenna, and all of it is being radiated out into the uh, uh, ether, <laughs> as they used to say, uh, and uh, being propagated out uh, maybe to the ionosphere and off to our distant station. This is a matched impedance condition. We use standing wave to indicate whether we have a matched impedance condition. What is a standing wave? Well, I'll show you one right here. So if you can see, hopefully, the blue wave going from left to right, that's uh, going f in the forward direction, and you see an equal amplitude wave coming back, the, the kind of light red or pink wave, and as they add together, you can see where their peaks and, and valleys are, as they add together, a voltage is created on the transmission line. Notice that the voltage that's created on the transmission line doesn't move. It just stands there, uh, but goes up and down and up and down. That is a standing wave. And we want to have a standing wave as low as possible, because that means that all of the energy, be, energy is going out um, at the antenna. If you have no reflected power, you will have no standing wave on uh, the transmission line. And we use standing wave meters. Here's one right here. A standing wave of one to one is a perfect match. 
and that's what we strive for, but uh, most of the time uh, anything under two to one uh, is acceptable. Anything under one and a half, you're, you're golden. Uh, and a standing wave meter, they come in various different types, digital or analog, it's installed between the transmitter output and the antenna feed line in your ham shack. That's generally where a standing wave meter is installed, between the transmitter output and the antenna feed line. Now, all meters are not created equally. Uh, some will operate at uh, VHF and UHF, while others will only operate at HF. Some are loosely calibrated, some are very tightly calibrated. Uh, you get what you pay for, just know uh, that they're not all created equally and you have to take into consideration the frequency and the power levels uh, that you will be using. If you go to a ham fest, which is kind of like a flea market for ham radio, they have them around uh, the, the country, um, you can find these. These are called directional watt meters. Uh, and uh, it's got what I call a goes in a port on this side and a goes out a port on the other side. And what you do is you, you feed the output signal from your transmitter uh, through the directional watt meter, and this goes out to your antenna. You can see this little slug right here, hopefully, that's got an arrow pointed in that direction. And you can use the meter to tell you how many watts of power are going in that direction. Then you can take this slug and turn the arrow the opposite way, and then you can read the amount of power that's being reflected back. And knowing those two values, you can calculate standing wave ratio using a table on the back of the directional watt meter. So a directional watt meter can also be used to, to indicate or to measure standing wave ratio. And uh, so here's a chart with voltage standing wave ratio, uh, and uh, one to one is perfect. Uh, two to one is acceptable. Three to one gets to the danger point. Um, and notice that the big number is always on the front. It's always called a three to one ratio, never a one to three. But a three to one ratio is a 25% power loss. Uh, and it didn't used to be a big problem with the old tube type transmitters because they had output tuning networks that could uh, help compensate for this, but with new modern solid state transmitters and transceivers, all of that energy that comes back from the antenna, let's say you're sending 100 watts out, but you're getting 25 watts coming back, it's absorbed in the uh, transistors of the transceiver. And um, the transceiver doesn't like that because uh, it causes them to overheat. So it will reduce the transmitter output from 100 watts maybe down to 50 watts. Well, you don't want that because you want the, the strongest signal possible. So that's where impedance matching is important. Uh, and generally, solid state transmitters uh, like uh, this, for example, ICOM 7300, will reduce power output uh, if a standing wave uh, is measured uh, above a 2 to 1 ratio. And there is a meter built right into this radio as well. So it, it will actually do that automatically. So what do you do? Well, if you can, you adjust the antenna to get a better match. But if you can't do that, you can use something that is called, and it's kind of a misnomer, it's called an antenna tuner, also known as an antenna coupler. And it's located after the standing wave ratio meter and before the coax and the antenna. And what this essentially does is generate a re-rebound wave. So remember, you've got 100 watts coming out from the, the uh, um, transmitter, you maybe have got 25 watts coming back. What this does is send that 25 watts right back out to the antenna. It generates a re-rebound wave through a tuning network. Uh, an L network is a very popular style uh, with an inductance or a coil and a variable capacitor that you can tune to get the re-rebound wave just right. Uh, and you can have a C input or an uh, L input, an inductor input or a capacitor input, or pi networks or another kind of antenna tuner. This looks like the Greek letter pi. That's why we call it a pi network. All right, some more questions. Which of the following should be considered when selecting an accessory SWR meter? Alpha. You see that? Alpha, the frequency and power level at which the measurements will be made. They're not all equal, so you've got to know. 
And what reading on an SWR meter indicates a perfect impedance match? One to one. Charlie. Yep, Charlie, one to one. And why do most solid state transmitters reduce output power as SWR increases? Alpha. Yep, to protect the output amplifier transistors. They'll overheat. And Keep what does an way. SWR meter reading of 4 to 1 indicate? Impedance mismatch. Yeah, a big one. In a big way. In a big way, indeed. And mm -hmm. what happens to power lost in a feed line? C. Converted to heat? It is converted to heat. And what is a benefit of low SWR? Reduce single signal loss? Yes, uh, all of your signal is being transmitted, and it works also the same way on receive, so you can receive better as well. So. And what is the most common impedance of coaxial cables used in amateur radio? 50 ohms. 50, 50 ohms, yes. And why is coaxial cable the most common feed line for amateur radio antenna systems? A. Yeah, it's convenient. It's easy to use. It requires few special installation considerations. Um, open wire line, for example, you can't get near metal. So what happens as the frequency of a signal in coaxial cable is increased? Delta. Yep, as the frequency goes up, your loss in the cable also goes up. And what can cause erratic changes in SWR? Think about this. Problem. Yeah, if you have a loose connection in the antenna or the feed line, your SWR will be great, and then all of a sudden it's really high, and then it goes great again. So, yeah. And which of the following types of feed line has the lowest loss at VHF and UHF? What do the broadcasters use? Charlie. Air insulated. Yes, air insulated hard line. So, what is standing wave ratio? Alpha. 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 Yep, it is a measure of how well a load is matched to a transmission line. All right, last section, practical antenna systems. This is what your neighbors want to see in your backyard. Uh, 400 foot tall towers with an array of dipole antennas on one side and a reflector screen on the other. This is what is known as a curtain antenna, uh, and uh, the only uh, place we have them now in um, the Voice of America in the United States are, is in Greenville, North Carolina, uh, at B site. Uh, and this antenna has a 20 dB or 100 times power gain. So if you have, um, you know, a hundred, uh, uh, or let's say a, a thousand watts going in, you're going to have a, a hundred thousand watts going out because of the gain of this antenna, your tax dollars at work. Okay, you're not going to get that by the HOA. They're going to say no. But a half-wave dipole, our friend, uh, this you, know, you can probably put up in trees and hide it, and, and uh, it's what we call a resonant antenna because it's designed to work well on one, maybe two bands, uh, and the overall length is one-half wavelength uh, for the frequency in question. And well, how do I know how long to build the antenna? Well, if you're going to... Um, use the metric system, a, a 20 meter band antenna is going to be a half wavelength or 10 meters long. So you could uh, you know, take 10 meters and multiply it by the, the inches here and convert it to the English system. Or you can use this formula. This is the most popular formula. There are a few others, but 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz times a velocity factor will give you the length in feet. 
uh, of a, a dipole antenna, a half-wave dipole antenna. And this is the current and voltage distribution in a center-fed half-wave dipole antenna. The blue is current and the red is voltage. So you see that the maximum amount of current is happening at the center. See here, uh, positive and negative, but it's the maximum. At the ends, it's the highest voltage point, but very little current. Uh, so this is a standard uh, distribution on uh, a half-wave dipole antenna. Uh, and just a rule of thumb, you want to get the current portion up as high as you possibly can. Looking at the, the half-wave dipole antenna from above, it's in this line right here, uh, a dipole antenna propagates um, signals broadside to the antenna or perpendicular to the antenna. So off of the ends of the antenna, very little signal comes uh, or is received. Uh, it's it's uh, perpendicular to the antenna is where the maximum uh, signal strength uh, is for reception and for transmission. And here, for example, is an uh, incoming uh, E field coming in. Remember, it's, it's corresponding to the physical orientation of uh, the antenna, and the E field uh, of a received signal is inducing uh, uh, voltages in the uh, dipole antenna, which is coming down to the receiver. And another way to look at that broadside pattern is if you have um, uh, here uh, the antennas in this uh, axis right here uh, and broadside to it. This figure eight uh, is the strongest signal for a dipole antenna is broadside to the antenna. So what can we say about these two antennas? One is longer than the other. What is the relationship to frequency? What do you think? Remember, they're a half wavelength at a certain frequency. Okay, you might remember that as frequency goes up or as frequency increases, wavelength decreases. So what we're looking at here is that this antenna is for a higher frequency than this antenna. This antenna is for a lower frequency. Well, let's say you build your antenna and you want to change it. How could you change it to a lower frequency? Well, you can do that by adding length. How do you change it to a higher frequency? By reducing or removing uh, length uh, of the antenna. That'll change the resonant frequency of the antenna. The longer an antenna is, the lower its resonant frequency. The, sh the shorter an antenna, the higher its resonant frequency. And uh, an antenna is a resonant circuit. Uh, the capacitive reactants and inductive reactants will be equal at some frequency. And that's, that's what this is all about. This is a resonant circuit diagram uh, with capacitive uh, reactants and inductive reactants in series with each other, in series with a resistance. And at a design frequency, these two will go away this is the radiation resistance of an antenna, so you radiate all the signal. Uh, this is more information than you need, but I just want to touch base on it, and you'll learn more about it in the general and extra classes. Remember those uh, car antennas that I sh uh, looked at, and we said that they're vertically oriented? Well, they're actually only a quarter of a wavelength high. Well, where's the other quarter of a wavelength? Well, it's the, the uh, car in that case, the ground plane of the car becomes the other half of the antenna, or you can add radials uh, either on the ground or elevated uh, to a vertical antenna, uh, and this antenna will work as well. So uh, a re it's a resonant antenna known as a quarter wave vertical antenna uh, with a, its height one quarter of a wavelength with radials coming out. Now, Sometimes, though, you'll see manufacturers say, I have an antenna that has higher gain than a quarter wave vertical. It's a 5 8 wave vertical antenna. Uh, and what it does is it gets this gain by actually squishing the, the pattern of the antenna down lower, lower toward the horizon, giving you increased gain. Um, but you need a special matching network 
uh, here in the base in order to make a 5 8 wave antenna work, uh, whereas a quarter uh, wavelength antenna doesn't require any special uh, tuning or, or um, coupling at the bottom. And mobile antennas, roof mounting, if you can do it at the center of the roof of the car, it provides the most uniform pattern. Otherwise, uh, you'll get some directionality if you have to mount it at the corner uh, of a vehicle. And I mentioned antennas are resonant uh, circuits. <laughs> this is the formula for a resonant frequency. You don't have to memorize it. You don't have to know it. I just wanted to point out that inductance and capacitance, note this is 1 over. So these have an inverse relationship to frequency. So as you increase inductance, frequency will go down, the resonant frequency. Or as you increase capacitance, the resonant frequency of an antenna will go down. Okay, what does that mean, Gary? Well, you may have seen antennas that have coils in the middle. This is an inductance, so this is an inductor. You're actually uh, providing a lumped inductance in the middle of an antenna, and what this does <clears throat> is it makes the antenna appear to be electrically longer by adding inductance. You could do the same thing by adding capacitance, but it's much harder to do that. So a lot of mobile antennas are going to have these coils uh, to make the antenna look electrically longer. You don't get something for nothing, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. The Yagi Uda antenna, we looked at that earlier. It's got a driven element that's a half wavelength long. It's got a reflector that's about 5% longer. It's got a director that's about 5% shorter. And it's directed, uh, directional toward the shortest element. Another kind of uh, gain antenna is a cubical quad antenna, which has a driven element which is one wavelength uh, in length. Uh, a reflector that's about 5% longer, and directors that are about 5% shorter. This is a cubical quad uh, beam antenna. And then satellite ten antennas. Satellite antennas are highly directional um, and uh, have a main lobe and the side lobes, uh, very good front-to-back rejection on uh, directional satellite antennas. And if you're going to be putting up your antenna, whether it be a dipole or a Yagi, you're going to probably want to invest in one of these. It's an antenna analyzer. Uh, it has a built-in radio frequency generator. Uh, they come in various sorts. This is one from MFJ, which is very popular, uh, but a, a bunch of other people make them as well. It measures impedance and resonant frequencies of antennas, so you don't even have to transmit in the antenna to know how it's going to perform at a particular frequency by using an antenna analyzer. If you don't want to invest in one of these right away, but you're a member of a local ham club, they may have one and you can maybe borrow it, uh, or better yet, get one of the members to come over and show you how to use it, so that you can, uh, again, continue your learning uh, by uh, using an antenna analyzer. On your HT, you're probably not going to make many adjustments to your antenna. You might replace it. Um, the rubber duck antennas that come with HTs are generally not very effective. Um, so aftermarket antennas can make improvements, and they're also very poor inside a car as the signal is shielded by the vehicle. That's just kind of common sense. And a lot of the modern uh, radios that you can buy now are using what they call SMA connectors or reverse SMA connectors. Uh, that's, uh, where is it, uh, do, 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 this little guy right here. Uh, these are standard connectors for radio frequency uh, cables, SMA, N connectors, BNC, also known as bayonet connectors, and the UHF or PL259 connector. These are good for higher frequency ranges, the SMA for example. Um, these are good for lower frequency ranges, but the, the UHF or PL259, which also might look like this, is the most popular high frequency connector uh, that is out there. Uh, and um, this type of connector that we're looking at here probably is from Amph Amphenol. Uh, it uses solder. We solder the center conductor here, and you sh solder the, the shield or braid here. Uh, you use rosin core solder for electrical work, never acid core. It's going to require a heavy-duty uh, soldering iron in order to get the solder to melt uh, in order to make a good connection. 
That's why I don't use this type of connector anymore. I use crimp PL259s where you solder the center conductor. That's no problem. But instead of soldering the shield, you crimp the shield. And I find it gives a, a much better, uh, more stable uh, connection, uh, fewer intermittents. Just my two cents. If you really want to go out, all out, you can use N connectors for f signals above 400 megahertz, for example. This is a coaxial uh, connector uh, that connects to the cable. The center conductor is here. It's got a shield here. And then it's got a second shield. And it's also got a rubber uh, grommet on the inside. This connector is waterproof. So the N connector, named after an AT&T engineer, Mr. Neal, uh, is the best kind of connector for use uh, at UHF and above, the N connector. And as I mentioned earlier, you want to use rosin core solder uh, when soldering in electronics, never acid core. Um, and when you're making a solder joint, on, whether it be on a connector or on a printed circuit board, you want something that is shiny and clean, not dull or rough or lumpy. These are also known as cold solder joints, which will be intermittent and, and not very good. So you want to avoid dull, uh, rough or lumpy connections uh, when you're soldering them. Those are bad solder joints. They'll cause you trouble. All right, last section for questions. What antenna polarization is normally used for long distance CW and SSB contacts on the VHF and UHF bands? You might have to remember back. You want to avoid the, the mobile signals? Horizontal. Yes, so you go horizontal. And when using a directional antenna, how might your station be able to communicate with a distant repeater if buildings or obstructions are blocking? How did I find the Channel 7 TV signal? You pointed, pointed it somewhere else. else. Yeah, I tried to find a path that reflects the signal. And where should an RF power meter be installed? After the transmitter, before the feed line? Yeah, in the feed line between the transmitter and the antenna. Very good. And which of the following is used to determine if an antenna is resonant at a desired operating frequency? Antenna analyzer. Yeah, like the MFJ one that I showed you there, indeed. And which instrument can be used to determine SWR? Directional watt meter. Yeah, if you're an English major, um, English major, you might uh, try to use an iambic pentameter, but no, a directional watt meter is what we're looking for. That's the one with the uh, arrow slug that you can point in one direction, then the other. So which of the following causes failure of coaxial cables all the time? A. Yes, water, moisture is always the problem. And why should the outer jacket of coaxial cable be resistant to ultraviolet light? B. Delta. It is delta, yes, because the water is always the problem. So ultraviolet light can damage the jacket and allow water to enter the cable. And what is the disadvantage of air core coaxial cable when compared to foam or solid dielectrics? It's what the broadcasters use, but... C. Yeah, Charter. you got you got to pressurize it. You got to either use nitrogen or dry air, which is kind of a real pain. So, which of the following types of solder should not be used for radio and electronic applications? Acid core. Yeah, acid core it used to be used in plumbing, but that, you know, with you know, PEX and everything else, that's not even used. So, what is the characteristic appearance of a cold tin lead solder joint? See, rough or lumpy? Yes, a rough or lumpy surface. And what is a beam antenna? Charlie. 
an antenna that concentrates signals in one direction. And which of the following describes a type of antenna loading? Oops, I guess went too far. <laughs> uh, yeah, I gave it to you. So it's electrically lengthening by inserting inductors in radiating elements. That's antenna loading, used a lot on mobile antennas. And which of the following describes a simple dipole oriented parallel to the Earth's surface? Probe. Yes, it's a horizontally polarized antenna. And what is the disadvantage of the short, flexible antenna supplied with most handheld radio transceivers? The rubber duck. D? Alpha? It is alpha. It has very low efficiency. They're pretty rugged, but it, it doesn't transmit circularly polarized signals. It transmits vertically uh, polarized signals. So, yeah, low efficiency. Very doesn't radiate very well. All right, which of the following increases the resonant frequency of a dipole antenna? If you want to increase the frequency, what do you do to the antenna length? C. Sure. Yeah, you shorten it. Shorter antennas resonate at higher frequencies. And which of the following types of antenna offers the greatest gain? D. Yep, the Yagi or Yagi Uda antenna. And what is the disadvantage of using a handheld VHF transceiver with a flexible antenna inside a vehicle? A. Yep, the signal strength is reduced due to the shielding effect of the vehicle. So, what is the approximate, the approximate length in inches okay, of a quarter wave vertical antenna for 146 megahertz? So we can go back and we can do the calculations. Um, so 146 is two meters, it's the two meter band. So a half wavelength would be one meter. Uh, quarter wavelength would be half of a meter. Anybody know how long that is in inches? I'll tell you, it's 19, 19 inches. And what is the approximate length in inches of a half wavelength, so now we're talking about a half wavelength, six meter dipole antenna? So for six meters, a full wavelength is six meters. Half wavelength would be about three meters. How many inches would that be, approximately? Again, I'll tell you, it's 112. So you might want to review that and <laughs> go over that, yeah. So in which direction does a half-wave dipole antenna radiate the strongest signal? Delta. Broadside. Yep, broadside to the antenna. And what is an advantage of a 5 8 wave whip antenna for VHF or UHF mobile service? Alpha. Yeah, it has more gain than a quarter wavelength antenna because it, it uh, brought the, the azimuth down closer to the horizon. And what is the major function of an antenna tuner, also known as an antenna coupler? A. Yeah, it matches the antenna system impedances to the transceiver's output impedance to get a, a to make the transceiver think it's you know loading into a one to one uh, standing wave ratio. You're you're fooling the transmitter so you get the full power output. Uh, it doesn't change the mismatch on the far end, uh, but it makes the transmitter happy. So yeah. And which of the following RF connector types is most suitable for frequencies above 400 megahertz? 
and Andy. yep after mr neil at at&t and which of the following is true of pl259 type coaxial connectors a no c charlie yeah they're very common they're the commonly used uh, ones for hf and vhf they're the most popular and which of the following is a source of loss in coaxial feed lines? A, water a, intrusion. A is true. What else? Um, all of them. All of them, high SWR. And if you have multiple connectors uh, in the line, all of those choices, uh, all of those things could be sources of loss. And what is the electrical difference between RG58 and RG213 coaxial cable? C. C. The thicker RG213 cable has less loss at a given frequency. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of Chapter 4. We made it. Thank you all for your patience in the, in the Zoom classroom. Uh, do we have any comments or anything uh, uh, tonight? Let me take off the spotlight. Any questions from anyone in the group? Okay, well then I'm going to ask you please uh, to read uh, Chapter 5 for next week. And... Um, I want to thank you for, again, your, your patience and your tolerance, and hopefully Zoom will hang in with us. Don't know what was going on tonight, but anyway, maybe my wife was running a high-bandwidth movie. <sighs> uh, don't think so, but okay. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. 73, and we will see you all next week. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks, Gary. Thank, thank you, Senator. 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 Senator.